Well, it's been about 18 months since we last covered that Star Trek fan film that doesn't seem to go anywhere. I can't believe it's been five years since the original promise was made. Carlos Pedraza from AXA Monitor is back to catch us up on all the happenings of AXA. It's day five of August 2020. Ahsoka's off for a walk. Can you help us help Guide Dogs Australia? Bitly slash TZ Guide Dogs. Beaming around the world across Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and YouTube. This is the eighth season of A Trek Zone Conversation with Matt Miller. Well, it's been about 18 months since we last covered this fan film Nothing really has happened, but a lot has happened. Carlos Pedraza from AXA Monitor joins me once again to chat about Star Trek AXA. Glad to be here, my <laughs> Oh, is that controversial? Uh, well, it's, you, you know, you'd think by now it would uh, have lost its luster, but uh, the controversy remains and continues <laughs> to grow. Well, the last time we spoke, Carlos, uh, we did meet up at STLV, which was 12 months ago uh, this week, which is absolutely incredible. Yes. But on the show, we haven't spoken about Axanar since February. I think Christian Gossett was actually my last guest. Plans were moving ahead. He was getting mm-hmm. into filming. He has done some filming. He, of course, is Alec Peters, has done some filming in his uh, Atlanta Warehouse Come studio. Uh, but it's kind of stalled at the moment. Really not of his own making. There, there is that component, but there is, of course, this little problem of a pandemic going around the world. Uh, yes, that's uh, certainly thrown... Uh, a bit of a, a curveball uh, at his plans. But even given that, uh, it was not proceeding apace. It was proceeding in fits and starts. And of course, at the center of all of this, as it usually is with Alec Peters, is is money and his constant raising of money from uh, fans who want to see the film and uh, are not persuaded by his past inability to to deliver but uh, but continue to to send money his way under a variety of guises and only some of them are directly related to the film itself and some are appear to be an uh, an end run around the uh, fan film guidelines and the uh, settlement between Axanar and uh, CBS Paramount uh, in their now how long how many years has it been uh, four four years uh, yeah. since the since the the lawsuit so we have seen in addition to money being raised directly for Axanar in well they're prohibited from doing it in a public uh, on a public forum and believe that they found a way around that by uh, creating a a private uh, fundraising site, basically a, a white label Kickstarter, except that they spread they spread the link to it everywhere. Uh, as so, and it's easy to get public access to. I have public access to that to that website. So it's not um, it is not the exclusive private fundraising effort that uh, was supposed to be. Uh, the case as a result of the settlement. Uh, But in addition to that, we've seen an expansion, amazing expansion in Axanar related merchandise. And even though the fan film guidelines are quite explicit about uh, fan films not being able to merchandise anything in order to raise money uh, f- uh, for their production. Uh, Alec Peters believes he's found a way around that by by conducting the sales through a separate uh, company, Aries Studios. And uh, of course, he controls both. He is the single sole proprietor shareholder of both, uh, both Axanar Productions and Aries Studios, um, so I'm not sure that in a, in a court, if you you if this went to trial, that um, he'd be able to uh, make the defense that it is a completely and utterly separate legal entity when in fact both of them are controlled solely by him, uh, and they're you know both raising money ostensibly for the same uh, thing. I mean, ostensibly for different things, but one is to support Aries Studios, but of course Aries Studios is the place where. Axanar is being produced. So six of one, half a dozen of the other is pretty much ending up being looking like, looking and sounding like the same thing. But we've seen uh, a, a huge increase in the uh, amount and types of merchandise that Alec Peters is offering uh, with Axanar's name on it from backpacks and 
tumblers to um, gosh, patches, of course, never ending stream of patches. Um, Always the patch. Yes. Uh, but, you know, every week there's like something else that's come out. And I, I can only imagine that uh, this is cafe press type merchandise where, um, you know, as orders come in, orders are submitted to the manufacturer, they slap on the logo onto an already created item, piece of merchandise, and then that is uh, shipped to the buyer. Uh, I can't imagine that um, Alec Peters has, even with the amount of money that he has raised, that um, he has that kind of money lying, kind of money lying around uh, creating inventory. Um, and even though he has experienced a measure of success in his fundraising through Airy Studios, through its Patreon, and through its merchandising, and through Axonar Productions, it's still not enough even to cover the uh, production expenses of Axonar itself. And in fact, they're looking at raising, I think, another fifty thousand uh, dollars to complete filming and, and post production for Axonar before it ever gets released, which who knows when so that's sort of the state a uh, status of where they are in terms of money and progress um they have gotten a lot of filming done a few months ago in at airy studios in georgia um they were scheduled to or are scheduled to shoot all of the scenes with aliens uh alien makeup in los angeles that was supposed to have happened this summer uh, because of the pandemic that's been postponed until who knows when. And uh, so a lot of things still still up in the air, uh, but, the, but the fundraising goes on. That's where they stand in terms of money, in terms of production. Other things are happening that are raising some potential new obstacles. Well, one of those uh, merchandising things that has actually gotten Alec into a little bit of hot water, although nothing more has sort of come of it publicly, are the pin sets, uh, fan sets who hold that license uh, did complain mm-hmm. to and they confirmed publicly on, on AXA Monitor that uh, that they had complained to CBS about a breach of their license conditions. There's this merchandising he's basically just finding mm-hmm. anything as you say it's probably a cafe press site and he's just finding everything and, and chucking chucking everything in and, and trying to uh, trying to wash some money out of it. Trademarks be damned um, you know the yeah fan sets is understandably upset at um, his trying to market Star Trek looking uh, merchandise for Axonar uh, that encroaches on their exclusive license for that. And again, a lot of the machinations around this happen behind the scenes, letters from lawyers and things that, you know, we don't typically get to see in public, but um, but are going on. And I'm sure that's happening here. In a related note, Peters, who loves rescuing dogs. And good on him for doing that, can I just say. And which is fine. Can't, you know, uh, I'm sure he helps old ladies cross the street as well. Uh, and good for that too. And bruise people. When, when they get to their house, he brews them a good cup of Klingon coffee. Oh yeah. Well, Rock Gino, I'm, I'm a big fan. But in addition to that, he, he commissioned the creation of a logo for this dog dog rescue effort that he's he's leading uh and it turns out that it was uh an almost stroke for stroke copy of a logo for a san antonio i forget which sport might be maybe it was soccer uh but the point being that when you look at side by side at the at the two logos it's clear that one which is the trademark symbol inspired and more than inspired it is a stroke for stroke reproduction with some slight alterations in like eyebrows and teeth but otherwise it's it's uh it's the same the same thing and um alec went on to admit this uh on on one of his unending live streams that he was inspired by or and you know had he had someone uh created based on but it's uh it's it is very nearly an exact copy so um so we're seeing the same kind of disregard for intellectual property here in his other endeavors as as we saw originally with axonar itself and continue to see uh through his merchandising efforts as well one man's inspiration is another's ip theft indeed indeed and you know and the the difference of course being fan films appropriate intellectual property that does not belong to them but what's always been very clear and what the fan film guidelines uh made even clearer is that there is a line around making money that you do not cross. Alec Peters chooses to interpret that as being being profitable, but that's not 
<laughs> what the line is. The line is making money, earning money, bringing in revenue. Uh, being able to offset that with costs does not make it right. Just means you're not as good a businessman as, as uh, other people might be. Um, mm. So there's that problem as well. We're seeing uh, the same pattern over and over and over again. Well, the thing that inspired me to reach out and uh, and connect with you, Carlos, was what happened last week. And, and it's sort of continuing on uh, this week a little bit. Gary Graham departure uh, of Axanar, which it now seems with a Reese Watkins post that uh, that it actually started off in December. Uh, uh, but according to Alec, the first he knew of it was last week when Gary made it official. Well, that again, uh, speaking of patterns, we're seeing the same one emerge here as we have other times in which uh, I think throw a, a great deal of doubt, cast a great shadow of a doubt on, on Alec Peter's version of these things. Uh, we saw it happen with Tony Todd when he left. He announced his departure to Alec and it was months before he acknowledged it publicly and only because an, a fan specifically asked him about it did he come clean about it and he continued to use tony todd's words and photos to continue to promote the indiegogo campaign for axanar and it was only when he was called out on it that he that he uh, admitted that that tony todd was no longer with the production and in fact turned around and started making all kinds of issues about uh about Tony Todd asking for for more money and, you know, and that that was the reason why they parted ways. And and we're seeing him make the same kind of issue around around Gary Graham. We saw this same pattern when Robert Meyer Burnett left as director, the second director. Of course, Kristen Gossett resigned in May of 2015, and that was kept quiet for a while, too. But with Rob Burnett, uh, same thing. Rob Burnett, when they left, uh, it, everyone claimed it was amicable. Um, they went their separate ways. And then, of course, in the ensuing months, the level of acrimony between the two grew and grew and grew. Uh, Alec Peters turned around and sued uh, Rob Burnett, making all kinds of claims about theft of property and such for, such that uh, was never, ever substantiated. In fact, he probably quite purposefully filed his lawsuit in a jurisdiction that had no power over over Rob Burnett uh, because Rob, of course, lives in California. Alec filed his lawsuit in in Georgia and it fizzled and, and went away. Same thing. He, you know, when Rob Burnett left, he praised him and thanked him for all he'd done and claimed it was amicable. And of course, there was all kinds of things going on behind the scenes that, as it turned out, were you know was an, was a growing brew of of ill will on on both sides. We're seeing it again now with Gary Graham, where. You know, the, the departure happened months ago and Gary Graham said himself said it was, you know, it was around Christmas time. And um, because Alec depends on his association, Axnar's association with the Star Trek alumni to be part of the credibility of the project, um, he doesn't tell anyone. And you know Reese, uh, Reese's uh, uh, apolo apology for this claims it was because they were trying to you know see if something might work out and that they might uh, make amends and, and continue on forward. But I think that given what we've seen in the in the past, where people leave, Alec doesn't admit it for months. Um, and continues to, to use their name. Uh, we saw it with his sponsorship from uh, Otherworld Computing, where they had ended their sponsorship while he, at the same time, kept claiming that everything was great and they were going to renew the sponsorship, et cetera. And it turns out that it had uh, come to a close weeks before. So again, history shows a pattern here that we're seeing uh, play out again. Uh, today's parting between him and Gary Graham could very well turn into tomorrow's next lawsuit, um, given the, the history around this. Gary Graham may sufficiently detach himself from the project and, and never look back. But uh, one never knows with, with Alec Peters. There's all kinds of things that I know are going on behind the scenes in this production that could potentially explode onto the public stage, in which case all bets are off. It usually will with Alec. There, there, there will be a moment where it'll come up. He'll be so he'll be so angered that he'll just go on a tirade, and and uh, the truth will come out uh, through his inability to uh, to just walk away from from being uh, detracted against. Yeah, detraction is a is a real soft spot for him. I think. <laughs> well, I do want to cover off last week's uh, live stream, and there's also something in this week's as well. But but speaking 
speaking of, of detraction, uh, just brings this next one up uh, to the fore. Uh, what he said in, in last week's live stream about AXA Monitor, and it's been a constant barrage over four, four or five years about uh, those that are against him. Uh, and what he said of AXA Monitor was that it's a cesspool of unaccomplished, unsuccessful people. How do you, as, as the group admin and the group creator, respond to that? <laughs> well, I mean, it's uh, at best uh, a broad brush criticism, not really based on facts, and at worst, uh, you know, just slander against some very fine people. I mean, whenever you try to paint a group with a broad brush, uh, you leave out these niggling little inconvenient things called facts, you know, and the reality is that the, the members of the group uh, are incredibly diverse. There are people from all walks of life, all ages, all different points of view, but the idea that that all of them are unaccomplished is, is ridiculous. We have Star Trek authors who are part of that group. We have other fan filmmakers who are part of that group. We have professional industry people who are part of that group. These are all people with much longer resumes than Alec Peters. Uh, again, he's just, you know, he's trying to uh, discredit a group with very little evidence and and just basically name calling. Um, I call it the neener, neener, neener defense. <laughs> well, he even got so specific in, in that little tirade there. He got so specific that there aren't any lawyers in the group. There, there aren't any of these uh, highfalutin people. And yet if you actually, as you just said, if you actually look at who is is in the group and we have people mm -hmm. successful people in their own rights successful lawyers you're yeah. successful in your field that's the field you've chosen it it is this broad brush it's this this just this attack if mm -hmm. you're not with me you're against me and i think the best thing about alec for for all for all intents and purposes he has stuck by his guns he's misguided guns but he's stuck by them for the better part of five years well he has no choice but to stick by them you know and, and the reality is that he's actually retreated from a number of positions over the course uh, of those years and uh and has changed the narrative several times as well so i i don't I don't see him being the, the picture of consistency in terms of of his narrative and even of the facts uh, behind his activities around Axnar. So, so you're probably being a, a bit more kind than I would be, uh, just given the fact that we, we've seen lots of flip flops, lots of uh, contradictions, lots of changes of course, lots of you know new villains identified and ostracized and old villains shunted aside because they're no longer convenient uh, stalking horses. So I, I should rephrase then, Carlos, and say that he's sticking to his guns of inconsistency. <laughs> his biggest consistency is his inconsistency. Um, How about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess that works. <laughs> I guess that works. It, it, it has been a while. It, you know, it's been really interesting because, um, you know, I was a part of Axe Monitor and, and, and the groups there and, and quite actively engaged in keeping an eye on Axanar and as as life does, you know, life changes priorities and, and, and I'd moved on, but I'd always kept an eye on it and, and just check in every now and then and then and see what else he's had to say. And a few people have, have kept me in the loop of, of things that I might have missed, which is which is really interesting. And I think it's the fact that nothing has changed since since Christian joined me last February to talk about the Axanar that could have been and, and to come to this point with a film shoot under his belt, with a pandemic that has stopped him. And, and I guess I'm being a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm being quite giving him the benefit of the doubt here, but there are still fan productions being made in this pandemic. Nick Cook of Starship Intrepid is one. Uh, his own PR man, new PR man, mm -hmm. without being a, a PR man, Jonathan Lane, uh, has come up with uh, Prelude to Axanar 2 uh, interlude. So to, to use the pandemic as a complete excuse as to why everything is shut down uh, on a fan level, on a fan production level, is is just an excuse. Very convenient. It's a very late excuse. It comes it comes so late in the process that it's you you really cannot lay fairly and accurately lay all the blame at the feet of of, uh, of the pandemic. And the pandemic's done everything else. It doesn't need to also shut down fan productions. Well, you know, I mean, the reality, and you're quite correct, that nothing gives a greater lie to his claims uh, about uh, how 
difficult it has been to create Axnar than his own chief apologist, Jonathan Lane's uh, near completion of his own fan film, uh, Interlude, which you just pointed out. And there's lots that Jonathan and I don't agree on, but the reality is that, you know, Jonathan does get things done. He publishes a lot. He raised a good chunk of money uh, quickly and put it to use right away, completely on the production of, of his film. And uh, he got professional directors to oversee the entire project and it's it's going very well and you know it's it's in many ways it's what all the best fan films are which is uh shooting for the moon with the least possible uh, amount of money and very often being able to 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 reach your goal and he has has done that um you know we know we've seen clips it's it's coming down the pike uh, very soon, but you know, I, I think he he does it as an homage to Axanar, but all it really does, I think, is to show how far behind the eight ball Axanar itself is in in getting itself completed, um, because it can't do it anywhere near as quickly as uh, as its chief apologist can. And it's been the thing that we've always said, uh, Trexone's coverage of Axanar, Axa Monitor yourself, and everyone has said that there's this massive amount of project creep that comes into our and, and I'm guilty of that mm-hmm. as well. I'm sure we're all guilty of, of a little bit of overreach and project creep and and uh, we, can, we can do this better, we can keep going, we can push it a little bit further. The problem with Alec is that that that's become the main strategy instead of getting it done. And as you say, Jonathan really has shown Alec up. He's raised a tenth of the money, gotten together um, the, the cast and the crew, filmed during a pandemic, post-produced during a pandemic, uh, and is now ready for release, admittedly a couple of weeks after his original uh, deadline, uh, his original release date. But we've got those trailers coming out and we've got the, the information coming out mm-hmm. that... Um, where, where, and it all boils down to where is Axanar? Well, and it really boils down to where is the money going, and that too. You know, we've <laughs> we've talked about this before. We have there is zero transparency around how this money is being raised. Zero. We don't even know if the amount he claims he's raised, he has raised. There's no way for anyone to know if that's inflated, deflated, where that money's going, how it's being spent. All of that is completely opaque. He conveniently tries to explain that away by saying that it's to keep people like you and I from criticizing how he's spending the money. But, you know, when you're raising money from the public, you have to allow for uh, some transparency, some accountability around that. That's the kind of role that you and I and other people have played in the fan film community. And um, what he's really doing is putting one over on on his donors, some of whom have been incredibly loyal to him by trying to, to scapegoat you and I mm. in a ploy to keep from having to be accountable to the people who are actually giving him money to do so. We know, uh, and I've reported over the years that money has been always, you know, the accountability over money being spent has always been an issue for this project. It continues to be. And uh, I'm going to be going to press later this week with some news that, um, well, let's just say that Gary Graham is not the last significant person who is going to be leaving um, or has already left um, the Axonar project. And that uh, continued concerns uh, over money and other production issues lie at the heart of it, as as they always have. You'll be hearing about that within a, within a few days from Axmonitor. Like you, I um, have not been publishing actively around Axonar for uh, several months now. Uh, same thing, you know, between work and the pandemic and life, you know, the daily and weekly reporting that, uh, that I have done in the past, I haven't been able to do, but I've continued to monitor the story. And um, behind the facade of, you know, a, a project that's going great guns, raising money and going into production is actually a lot of major problems uh, coming up and uh, or have already come up and, and are, are now going to bubble forth in, into the public. So for those stalwart supporters who think that Axonar is just around the corner, I think they're going to be waiting mm. even longer. One one figure that uh, just popped into my mind listening to, to you talk there, Carlos, I think I, I'm going to get this together and I'm going to work it out, is exactly how many fan productions have been released in the time since Alex said that 
Axanar was coming. That that very first initial uh, following prelude to Axanar, here's, here's the prelude, we're making this next bit. It's going to be a feature film, admittedly, but just off the top of my head, I can think of four Aaron Van Der Klee fan films, two from Gary O'Brien, uh, there's been three or four from Nick Cook of Starship Intrepid, uh, Tommy Craft's Star Trek Horizon, mm-hmm. uh, just rattling them all off here. There's been all of these productions done, Jonathan Lane's interlude as well, all done mm-hmm. in the time that Alec has said, yes, I'm making Axena. I think that really boils down the reason that we're here and you're called Axa Monitor and I check in with Axana every so often. There will be people who will continue to to follow and support Alec Peters probably in, in, into time immemorial, but but I think uh, more and more people, particularly those around the project, are are waking up to see just how troubled this this project is. I mean, you know, I left off uh, the Axana screenplay writer Bill Hunt in the list of people who've left. That he also, you know, Bill Hunt had left months before Peter admitted that he had left. He turned around and found Paul Jenkins as director. And then that led to, I don't know how big of a rewrite of, uh, I mean, it was pretty, pretty big because of course, you know, uh, Bill Hunt's script was for a feature and, uh, you know, this, these two uh, short films are a maximum of 30 minutes. So, um, so there's some, you know, and then of course the change in format from a narrative to a, you know, faux documentary like uh, Prelude itself was. So that's changed a lot. But you know, that uh, script was worked over quite a bit by by Paul Jenkins, and um, so we don't know the production that Alec Peters has said would be so easy to create with with green screens in the same spirit that they'd done with Prelude, Project Creep again turned into, you know, these massive shoot dates on sound stages in Georgia and in and in California and with, you know, tons of cast and, you know, using the the bridge, which originally they had built and wasn't even in the initial script for the two short films. It's just mushroomed in scope. And of course, when that happens, it's hard to know when you're going to be done, when you're ready to keep, you know, when you're, when you're ready to, to, to finish, when everything keeps changing. And with Gary Graham leaving now, you know, they're turning over all those lines to uh, a new actor who's going to be portraying uh, Sarek instead of, of Soval. And um, Alex, Peters in his statement talks about, you know, this happens all the time in the industry and yeah, people come and go all the time in the industry. But again, this is a fan film, not the industry Uh, in a fan film where you raise money based on things like Trek alumni who you have appearing in the cast and then their departure changes the dynamics and changes the value proposition of your film. And that's what we're seeing happen with Axanar and its value proposition is getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And, um, you know, where once, you know, Saval being in both Enterprise and Axanar was a big deal. Now we have an actor who who has publicly said, had terminated his relationship with Axanar and in fact says that he was taking a, a career hit because of his continued support mm. of the uh, of the project. And that when he went to Alec and said, look, you know, I my career is not in great shape because I'm continuing to be attached to your project. I need some more money to be compensated for that. And of course, Alec refused, you know, saying he didn't have the money, but of course we don't know how much money he has or doesn't have. We don't know where it's going. We don't know, you know, what flexibility he has uh, to do it. All we know is that they weren't able to work that out. And so Gary uh, Graham left, but this unending unwavering support for Axanar that Alec has always claimed uh, people like JG Hertzler and, and uh, Gary Graham have had uh, for the project doesn't appear to be quite so unwavering anymore. Well, Carlos, it's fascinating to uh, to hear from you again and and dive into Axanar and, and see that really the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> There's another adage about time passing and, and, and stuff like that. It, it really all applies here to Alec Peters and Axanar. And uh, maybe sometime soon we'll have you on the show to, uh, to talk about a completed film. But uh, I somehow don't think... It's ever going to happen. If it ever does, it will be a much diminished version of what was originally envisioned. Much diminished. Well, Carlos, thanks for your time. Thanks for checking in and having a Trek Zone conversation. Sure. And, uh, oh, it was good talking to you, Matt. Let's, uh, let's do it again soon. All right. 